Okay, well today we're going to resume our discussion on chapter 3. We'll be talking about chapter 3 for a, a little while yet here. Um, remember that we're talking about discrete random variables. And uh, just to refresh you, um, we talked a little bit about what um, what random variables are earlier, earlier in this chapter. Um, but just kind of the main idea here is that before when we were talking about probability in chapter 2, we were assigning probabilities to various outcomes in the sample space. So again, flipping a coin, we talked about what's the probability of getting a head, what's the probability of getting two heads in a row, etc. cetera. Um, and now we've introduced this idea of a random variable in which we're just going to assign probabilities to the, to the various values of x. So instead of talking about each outcome in our sample space, we're going to set up a random variable which is a, again, is a function from, from our sample space into the real numbers and we're going to assign probabilities that way. So it's sort of a it's sort of a um, equivalent way of thinking about probability, but this is a slightly more formal way that we'll use moving forward. Uh, so that's kind of the, the connection from chapter two to chapter three here. And uh, when we're talking about, remember we talked about uh, discrete and continuous random variables, two types there. Uh, here we're talking about the discrete variety. Um, discrete random variable just means that it can take on only a finite number of values or some um, countably infinite number of, of values. Um, that's, that's what a discrete random variable is. And then we talked about two ways, introduced two ways of um, specifying the, the probability distribution of the random variable x. And those two ways are the, the probability mass function, the PMF, and then we also, um, at the end on, on Friday, introduced the, the cumulative distribution function, the CDF of x. Uh, so just Continuing to review here what we talked about already, um, this is what I mean by the probability mass function. So talking about the, remember we're assigning, we're assigning probabilities to the various values of x. And since we can write, write down what all these values are, uh, this is the way we'll define the probability distribution. Um, little p of little x is just the probability that, that the random variable capital X is equal to that lowercase value of x. And uh, we saw the conditions there. We just need our probabilities, of course, need to be between zero and one inclusive, and the sum over all possible x uh, has to equal one. So kind of connecting back to those ideas we saw back in chapter two. And then, uh, and then we have uh, this this sort of this sort of alternate way of defining probability distributions. And again, it's called the the cumulative distribution function, the CDF, and. Um, so for a random variable x with a certain probability mass function, the CDF is defined for every number by just the, the probability that that random variable x is less than some small value x. And, um, and we can just sum up all the probabilities that uh, fall, of numbers that fall less than that number. Um, and we, we looked at an example. So, so again, sort of intuitively, the CDF is the probability that the observed value that, that, that the little x is at most is at most little x. Okay, so then I then I put up this example and I, I don't think I did a very good job of convincing you that this is this is how it went. So again if we have a, if we have the this is um top of page four of your chapter three notes. Um, okay so if we have a if we have a PMF given here, so x can take on three different values, negative two, zero or three and then just sort of generically assigned, assign those probabilities. Probability of being negative 2 is 0.5. Probability of 0 is 0 0.3. Probability of two, 3 is 0.2. I wanted to, we wanted to say what the CDF was and then kind of make a picture of it. And so I, I wrote down this, this step function here on the left side. Um, and again, I don't think I did a good job of convincing you. So let me, let me put up a different picture here to kind of, to kind of show you the and this is not in your notes, uh, but to show you the PMF and the CDF side by side. So here, here on the, the left side of the, of the screen, we have the, the PMF. And again, what this tells me is that the probability of negative 2 is 0.5. If you trace that over, it should be 0.3. So the, the graph there is just sort of a different way of representing that little table that was on the previous page. Uh, 
and then I've then I've sketched out, resketched out, I guess the, that picture from of the CDF that I that I wrote down before. And so um, remember the the CDF is the probability of being less than than that little x value. Um, so for example, what we saw before is uh, capital F of negative two. Again, this is the probability that the random variable x is less than or equal to negative negative two, to sort of by definition. Um, so I think that was pretty straightforward that the the CDF at that value equals 0.5 because again, if you if you sort of start if you start here at negative two and go go on back to the left, all the numbers that are smaller than negative two, there, there's no probability there. Um, so I think so. So this is. 0 0.5, which does also happen to be the same as the PMF of negative 2, obviously. And then, but then, then we jump up here to um, capital F of 0, again, which is the probability that the random variable x is less than or equal to 0. And so if you look at the PMF, that involves, that involves starting, here at, starting here at zero and going, going back and adding up all the probabilities that, going back to the left, adding up all the probabilities that are less than or equal to zero. Um, so, that, so that means I include, so if I start at zero and go to the left, I have the negative two here. So I have this 0.5 mass there, but I also have to include zero. So I also have 0.3. So that's why, that's why the CDF of zero is is 0 0.8. And then of course, uh, again of course, uh, I could take, the CDF is defined for any number, any number little x. So if I take some, some value that's in here, maybe let's say, let's make that a little, let's say this is positive 2, and I go up here, I find that capital F of 2, which is the probability that x is less than or equal to 2. So again, conceptually, I come back over here to where 2 would be for the PMF. So if I start, if I start here at 2 and go back off to the left, the probability being less than 2, um, I'm only going to pick up these, these two point masses as well. So going back, it's going to be all 0 except for when I hit these two values. Um, so here, this is still going to be 0 0.8. So that's kind of the idea of what this, how this step function represents the, the CDF for a discrete random variable like this. And again, that's why I, that's why I wrote it out as this. That's just a way of um, writing out what the CDF is. is that, uh, does that clear things up a little bit? Does that make more sense, kind of what we're talking about here? Yeah. So you're talking right here? Yeah. I mean, you the same one above it. Like, oh, wait, you didn't write it out. So, I, yeah, so I didn't write out, I didn't write out for this point here. But, yeah. It's the point less than zero, but on the other one, you have like negative two on the tail. So what that means is that when x is less than zero, so when x, when x equals zero, my CDF is point, is point eight. Maybe I didn't understand your question. No, uh, yeah, I, I kind of worded it. Like when you have 0 0.5, if. Uh, right here? Yeah. Okay. So, but not when you have like x is uh, less than or equal to 0. But then on your previous slide, when you have. When you're talking about the same. Oh, oh, oh. Zero. You're saying I made a mistake here. I was just wondering. Cause that, I think that was part of the reason why I was so confused last time. For, no, for point, for point 0.5, you said if negative 2 is greater than or equal to x, but less than 0. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering why the notation is different. That's so I, I think I think this is the same this is the same thing. Um, so so the the negative two the that range from when x is um, from negative two inclusive up to zero not but not including zero um, then my CDF uh, is at point five. 
Is that? Yeah. We're okay. So, but then as soon as I hit negative two, as soon as I hit uh, zero, rather, then I, now I jump up um, to include to include the mass to include this mass that's at zero. So, um, so let's say so for example the the CDF of um, negative zero point zero one for example. <coughs> so right right before I get to zero, my CDF is still at point five. But when I get to zero, my CDF jumps up to point eight. Okay. So until until I get to zero, I'm still at that. The problem being less than that is still just point five. But then as soon as I hit zero, I jump up there. Okay. Yeah. A little more sense about what we're talking about here. Is this okay? Um, again, the, the main point is that these are just two equivalent ways of, of saying what the distribution of this random variable is. Um, given either one of them, you can find the other one and, uh, and vice versa. So I'm given the PDF as a, a PMF as I was here, probability mass function. I can find what the CDF is, and we'll also see here in a second that you can go the other way. So if I, if I tell you what the CDF is, you can tell me what the PMF is. Um, before we get to one more example, let's, let's uh, show some properties here of, what the, C, of the CDF. So um, picking back up here on page four of your chapter three notes. Uh, so this is, this is true of all, of all CDFs, of any, any CDF you could think of. Um, it must be, the CDF must be non-decreasing. So um, what I mean by that is if, if X is less than Y, then the CDF of X can be no bigger than the CDF of Y. So it could be equal to, again, in the previous page, our CDF was flat in some of those areas. Um, but it can it can be non non decreasing. It can't go back down. Um, it's always it's always moving upwards or or staying the same. Uh, a little bit more abstractly, the the limits at at positive and negative infinity are, infinity are zero and one. So as as x goes off to negative infinity, probability of being less than that is goes to zero. Probability of being less than or equal to x as you go off to positive infinity is is one. Again, that's that's visible on. The green, the green picture here. So again, my CDF is, is zero going off to infinity. On the other end, it's going off to one. Or it's at one, actually. Um, and it's right continuous. So the CDF must always be right continuous. Um, can anyone tell me what that means? Anybody know what right continuous means? So you said that it'll eventually hit one, and it'll stay at one. So as it approaches infinity, as it approaches infinity yes. So so that's that's this property here. So sort of the um, what this means is that the limit as x goes to infinity of the CDF equals one. So that's 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 what number three says. But right right being right continuous is a slightly different thing. Yes. When, when it steps up, it's it's uh, continuous on the step up part. Yes. It, that yeah, that's exactly the intuitive part. Is that um, as as you approach any point from the right, so as I'm if I'm at zero and I'm going towards negative two, it's continuous the whole way there. Um, so what this means is that the limit of my CDF as I as I approach um, any number, let's just say any number a from the right. So if I put a a plus, that just means I'm approaching it from the right. Um, then this will equal the CDF of that of that number. So again, we can look at it, look at a picture of that. So if I'm approaching my CDF, I'm approaching if I'm approaching negative two from the right there, um, that limit is actually going to be equal to when I when I actually get to negative two, I'm going to be at the CDF of that value. So, kind of a theoretical distinction there, but um, just so we all know what that means there. And then um, just to note that the CDF and the PMF give you equivalent information. So again, if you're told one, you can figure out what the other one is there. 
And then to note the, the PMF is going to be bigger than zero here where that CDF has jumps. So when the CDF, uh, before we saw that where the PMF was, was bigger than zero had, had um, positive probability, that's where our CDF had those jumps in the step function. Okay, so there's just some, more, some properties of what the CDF is. Uh, let's, do, let's do another example here, uh, kind of going the other direction now. So if I, I give you what the CDF is, and uh, then we can figure out what the PMF is. Okay, so X is some discrete random variable with the CDF that's given there. So let's draw a quick picture of that. Um, so my CDF is going off to the off to the left there. When I get to zero, I have a jump, and I go up to um, zero point two. So the probability of being less than or equal to zero is um, zero point two. Uh, then I continue on there. I have no more mass until I get over to one. When I jump up again, and now I'm jumping up three three tenths. So I go up to up to point five. Again, kind of same same looking picture as we saw before. Uh, from one to two, I don't gain anything until I get to two, and then I again jump up. Uh, Point two, zero point three. Um, I'm sorry, I've drawn drawn the wrong picture here. Sorry, we jump up just one one tenth here to point three. Continue on, then we jump up to point five, and then when we get to three, we jump all the way up to all the way up to one. And the CDF will continue on there at one until we get to infinity. Why don't you jump to point five between one and two? Yes, so so I made I made that mistake. So the CDF is uh, giving me the cumulative probability now. So so we'll we'll, we'll take this and we'll, we'll go back and see what the what the PMF was. Um, now, now I'm just I'm just drawing a picture of what that function is. So no, no kind of, don't think any any deeper than there quite yet. Um, okay, so let's let's go ahead and find the PMF again. So so x can the possible values that x can take on is uh, zero, one, two, and three. So then for each one of those, we want to find what the PMF. What the PMF of that value is. So what's the probability that x equals zero? So again, this is just the probability that x is equal to little x. So what's uh, what's the probability that x equals zero? So it should be 0 0.2. Um, so just to quickly note here, so this the prob the PMF is bigger than zero where where the CDF has jumps. So when when it makes a jump, that means that the PMF is is something positive there. So maybe maybe I'll write it out this way. So this is this is the CDF of zero, which is equal to the probability that x is less than or equal to zero. Another way to think about this maybe is this is the probability that x equals zero plus the probability that x is less than zero. <coughs> That's maybe another way of thinking about it. So that the pr the probability that x equals zero is you can see there is point two. How about the probability that how about the probability that x equals one? So what's the what's my PMF of one there? Point one, exactly right. So that the the area I gain going from um, when when I get to one there is just just one tenth. All right. How about probability that x equals two? Two. Yep. Point two. 
And finally, the probability that x equals 3, 0.5. Everybody with me? Is that okay? Okay. So again, kind of here's that just that duality between the PMF and the CDF. Given one, you can find out what the other one is, um, just like that. Okay. Let's do a slightly more advanced example. Up until now, we've been looking at discrete random variables that have um, a finite list of outcomes. We can now talk about one that has uh, infinite but countably infinite number of outcomes. So we still have a discrete a discrete random variable here. Uh, okay, so starting at a fixed time, we're going to make some assumptions here. We can we observe the gender of each newborn child at a particular hospital until... Yes, sir? Can you say something that would not be countably infinite? Oh, yeah. So what's, what's something that would not be countably infinite? Anybody have... Um, so, so the natural numbers are countably infinite, right? So the natural number is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So there's an infinite number of things there, um, but sort of the distinction is you can you can list them out in an order. You can order you can order out what they are. So uh, countably infinite uh, or uncountably infinite um, set of numbers would be would be any interval. So even just the interval from zero to one of all real numbers, um, you can't you can't list out you can't list out in order what all the real numbers are in between zero and one. So there's an infinite number of things between 0 and 1, and it's uh, uncountable. You can't write an ordering of that. So um, again, that's sort of beyond the scope of what we talk about in this class. But um, have, is that terminology you guys have heard in your previous math classes? Yeah? OK. So that's, again, just kind of what we're talking about here. OK, so again, in this example, we're looking at uh, births until we get a boy. So. Um, Let's let lowercase p equal the probability that we get a boy so that on any particular birth, let's say we get some generic probability, little p. And we're going to assume that successive births are independent, which um, we're not going to say whether that's a good in assumption or not. It's probably OK. Um, and we want to define the random variable x to be the number of births observed until we get that first, until we get that first boy. Okay, so what? Let's just quickly write out what are my possible values. What are my possible? So this is the number of births until until a boy is born. So let's say starting right now, if we went over to the OSU hospital and look at each each baby that's born, um, which of course we would not be able to do, but. Uh, and we and we look out the number of births until we get until we get a boy. So what are the possible values that x can take on? Yes, exactly right. So one, two, three, four, and so on. And that there's no no upper bound there, right? It could could uh, theoretically have girls born forever. <laughs> so possible value that x can be any any positive integer there. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, let's uh, talk about finding the PMF of x. And again, we have to um, write this down for every value of x, or, or hopefully we can get some sort of a formula so we don't have to write everything, everything down here. Um, so again, let's start, let's start with the first one. So we have P of 1, which is the probability that x equals 1. So what has to happen for x to be equal to 1? First, yeah, that's exactly right. So that's, this is just the probability that the first baby born is a boy. Or we could sort of shorthand that and say that's the probability of, of b, probability of getting a boy. And we uh, said on the in the example we said the probability of of, of b is um, you know what, I'm going to make a quick change. Uh, let's instead of writing another little p there, let's let's make this a lowercase q. Just there's 
feel like there's we use the letter P a lot, so let's avoid a little confusion and, and write it that way. So so this is equal to some some value Q. Maybe that's 0.5. We're going to leave it as a general number there for now. Okay, so that's that's the PMF of one. Let's let's talk about the second one. P of two is the probability that x equals two. So what has to happen such that the that x equals two? So again, if the first baby that's born x equals two means that the first first boy baby is my is the second baby that I observe. So that means I have to get a girl first and then a boy. Exactly right. So, so let's write that out. So this is the probability of getting a girl. Uh, let's say first getting a girl. First is girl. And the second is a boy. Or shorthand this a little bit and we'll write probably getting a girl intersect getting a boy. So girl first, then boy. Um, so we have some intersection notation again here. Um, what can I do with that, that intersecting probability? Whoever just told me the answer, how'd you do that? Well, you know if it's a girl, it's not a boy, so it's one minus Q. And the second one has to be a boy, so it's Q. Right, so why, and why are you multiplying those together? Yes, and? <laughs> and we're assuming they're independent, right? So we've said assume that successive births are independent, so this is the probability of getting a girl times the probability of getting a boy, which again, probability of getting a girl is 1 minus Q. Probability of getting a boy on my second birth is, is Q. So again, we can jump from that second line down to the third line because of independence. Okay, so then uh, let's keep going here. Little p of 3 is the probability that x equals 3. Again, for the first boy, for, for the first uh, baby born, first boy baby born to be the third one, that means we need to get a girl, we need to get a girl again, and then we need to get a, a boy. So first we need to get a girl, and we need the second baby to be a girl, and then we need the third baby to be a boy. So you can kind of see where this is going. Um, again, we have independence, so we can multiply these together. And so we just have 1 minus q squared times q. Can anybody uh, pick out a pattern here so we don't have to write down any more of these things? So what's the, in for, for a generic number x, what's the probability that <coughs> x equals x? Exactly right. So 1 minus q to the x minus 1 times, times q. So again, if, if capital X equals little x, so that the first boy baby comes on the little, little x, x birth, that means I need the first x minus 1 births to be all girls, um, and then the last one to be, to be a boy. So the first x minus 1 children all had to be girls. Those are independent, so we just multiply that together x minus 1 times, and then tack on a q there for the last baby born being a, being a male. So here's sort of our here's sort of our general formula. Um, again, this is if x equals one, two, three, and so on. And then uh, and then p of x equals zero otherwise. So again, if I take the probability of 1.5, for example, that's that's zero. I can't 
can't, I can only have positive integers there. So p of x equals this formula here. If x equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, um, and then it equals 0 otherwise. Everybody OK with that? OK, so that's, that's the PMF. Yes, sir? Would that PMF approach one but never actually be one? Uh, so would the PMF approach one but never be one? Um, right, so that depends what Q is, right? So, yeah, so, so the CDF maybe is more what you think. The CDF eventually will get, we'll get a boy. We'll be certain that we have, as X goes off to infinity, that's the, the positive limit there. So you can play around with that in your calculator for a very large X, depending what Q is, uh, that will change if it's close to 1 or close to 0. <clears throat> OK, so let me just quickly write down again <clears throat> the PMF, P of X, equals uh, 1 minus Q to the X minus 1 times Q for X equal 1, 2, and 3, and so on, and it equals 0 otherwise. Same thing that was on the previous slide. So, so now let's find the CDF of, of x. And I've uh, put in this little helpful, helpful tip for you. Um, so this, this involves uh, a geometric series, if, uh, as, as we'll see in a minute. Just remember that the first k terms of some geometric series are, are as listed there. OK, so the CDF, so again, for any For any positive integer x, uh, the CDF of x is equal to, again, just by definition, the probability that that random variable is less than or equal to, less than or equal to x. Which, uh, as we saw before, is just the summation of. Um, of all the probabilities of less than or equal to that x. So again, I can just sum up. Again, I'm just writing out by definition what we what we saw before. That if I want the probability being less than or equal to x, I can just sum up all the prob probabilities involving x and anything less than that. So what does that equal here in this case? Uh, this is now equal to um, the probability that. Uh, so we, what we can sum, we can write down this is equal to y equals one up to x. Of, of the PMF, which is uh, 1 minus Q to the Y minus 1 times Q. So again, just kind of writing out by definition uh, what, everything we've seen so far. And now the trick is to actually solve for that sum there so we don't have to always add up a bunch of things. Okay, so we can rewrite this. This is equal to um, Q times the summation um, I'm going to define a new a new I'm going to sort of change this index here. I'm going to let uh, Z equal Y minus 1. So I'm just changing changing the index of this sum here um, which means that I can go now from Z equals 0 up to X minus 1 of 1 minus Q to the Z. Just kind of rewriting this, this thing, changing my index there, and now I can use now I can use that uh, that little hint up at the top of the page there. Um, so here a would be equal to one minus q now, and um, and k equals k equals x minus one. So this is just q times um, one minus one minus q to the um, to the x and then divided by 1 minus a again 1 minus a here is 1 minus q so 1 minus q and if you simplify this this is just 1 minus 1 minus q 
to the X. <clears throat> There's some tricky algebra going on here, but um, it's the way we can actually calculate what the CDF is without actually having to do all those all those sums. Everybody with me here? Yeah. Where is Y coming from? So where you mean right right here? So so I'm just saying um, again if I want the probability of the CDF is just the probability that my random variables is less than or equal to X. So whatever X is. Um, I want to add up the probabilities that x that that uh, that the, the random variable is less than that. So if, for example, I want the probability that x is less than or equal to three, then I need to add up. Um, so, f of three, which is the probability that x is less than or equal to three, here we just know that that's this, the PMF of uh, one, two, and and three. So I'm just adding up all the numbers, the, the PMF for all the numbers that are less than or equal to X. And I'm just using Y as sort of a generic index there. Does that, does that make a little more sense? So, so again, y, y doesn't necessarily mean anything. I'm just using that. If I want the probability being less than X, I need to add up uh, from one, two, three, four, all the way up to, all the way up to X. Okay, so so let me let me write this write this out a little bit more formally. So this this gives me that um, CDF uh, is equal to um, zero if x is less than one. So for any number less than one, the CDF is going to be zero. It's going to be coming in at zero all the way until we get to one. Um, as soon as I get to one, it's going to start doing jumps every every integer, right? So that's going to be uh, one minus one minus q, and then I'm going to throw some notation at you here. This floor function of of x, um, if x is bigger than or equal to one, and um, this floor function, this is. Uh, This is equal to the um, largest integer that's less than or equal to less than or equal to x. So that's just my way of shorthanding. This is, I'm making little little steps, and, and between so between each integer, the CDF is going to be a flat line. So between one and two, it's flat. It's going to jump up. It's, Go be flat over to three, and then and so on. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's finding the CDF there from the PMF, uh, and now we can we can use that CDF to answer answer any number of questions that we might be interested in. So, for example, what's the probability that x is more than three? But uh, no greater than six. Um, so I want the probability um, that x is bigger than three, but no greater than six. So I want the probability that x is between uh, is more than three, but but less than or equal to six. So there's a number of ways you could do this. Of course, we could we know this is equal to the probability that x equals four plus the probability that x equals five. The probability that x equals six. Um, so that that's one way of doing it. And you could calculate that out that way, um, or we could also write this down as the probability that um, x is less than or equal to six, and subtract off the probability that x is less than or equal to three.
So if I want the probability that x is bigger than 3 but, but less than or equal to 6, I can take all the probab being, probability of being less than 6 and subtract off the probability that's less than or equal to 3. And this will just allow me to use the CDF that I've already, that I've already calculated. Um, so this is equal to capital F of 6 minus capital F of 3, which we can write out uh, using that formula from before. This is 1 minus 1 minus Q um, to the 6th, uh, sorry, minus 1 minus 1 minus Q to the third. And this is just uh, 1 minus q to the third minus 1 minus q to the sixth. Everybody with me? Are we you're all okay on kind of stepping through writing out what these what these things mean? So again, if you in this case it would not be that bad to calculate calculate this thing. But if I wanted a if I had a wider range of numbers, like what's the probability that x is between thirty and sixty or something like that, you wouldn't wanna you wouldn't want to calculate all those prob probabilities by hand. You would instead want to do this use the CDF to find that find that probability. Okay, well, I was going to do I was going to do one more example, but um, out of interest of time, I think we need to push on to section three point three. Um, so let me skip over some slides here and jump to section three point three. <coughs> the other example I was going to do was essentially another version of kind of what we just did. So um, maybe I'll post some slides on that on that later. Okay, so section 3.3, uh, now we're talking about expected values, and I think this is really where um, probability starts to get interesting, is where we can start to think about expected values. Um, so sort of in general, when we, when we discuss the probability distribution, uh, the PMF or the CDF of some, some random variable um, X, we might be interested in, in giving some numerical summaries of, of that random variable. And the two, two ways we can do that are talking about the expected value of x and the variance, the variance of x. So they both involve the same thing. Um, we'll start with the expected value. Um, so what, what the expected value is kind of, a, kind of conceptually, that gives us, uh, it gives us a numerical summary of this distribution. So we'll, we'll look more of that, at that. But kind of intuitively, it gives you sort of what you could think about as a typical value of that random variable. So if you did... If you repeated your experiment many, many times, um, this would tell you kind of what you could expect to what you could expect to get. Um, so, as, as sort of a motivating example here, um, going back to gambling, it's our favorite favorite thing here. Um, so, suppose we have this this game. It's a very simple game where you spin a wheel and it costs fifty dollars to play. Um, so, capital X now is our outcome. So, you can get a one, two, or three. So, this is maybe a a wheel with three wedges on it. And we have certain probabilities of getting each one of those values. And then we're told what our winnings are. So if I spin a, if I spin a one, I win $45, which means um, that I have, overall I've lost uh, $5 because I paid $50 to play. Um, so if I win only $45, I'm, I'm out. My net is negative $5. Um, and so on. if I spin a two, I win $75, which means that my net is $25 since I spent $50. Um, Similarly, if I spin a three, that's bad. I only get forty dollars back, which means I've lost. I've lost ten. Okay, so suppose that I play this game a thousand times. Uh, what sort of what would you expect to have at the end of? What would your average profit be? Your average net profit be at the end of that a thousand times of playing this game? Well, my average profit simply equal to uh, 1 over 1,000 times my total profit. And so whatever my total profit is over that 1,000 games, I just, I'm just taking the average of that. 
Um, and again, we don't know what that will exactly be, but it should be close to, should be approximately equal to um, 1 over 1,000 times. Um, well, if I play this game 1,000 times, um, about one-third of the time I will lose I will lose five dollars. So, so if I play this game about about one third of the those one thousand games, I will lose five dollars. That's the probability that I've landed on a about one third of the time. Um, I will land on on that one, and so I'll lose five dollars. Um, about one sixth of the time, I will win twenty five dollars. So. About one sixth of those one thousand spins, I'll win twenty five dollars, and then about half of the time, uh, I will lose. I will lose ten dollars. So about a third of the time, I lose five dollars. About a sixth of the time, I win twenty five, and about half the time, I lose lose ten dollars. And so uh, some the 1,000s here cancel out, um, and this is equal to, uh, you can see this is equal to the probability that I get a 1 times the, the net winnings of spinning a 1, plus the probability of getting a 2 um, times the net winnings of spinning a 2, plus the probability of spinning a 3 times the net winnings of spinning a 3. So where n of x is that is that third row of the that net of x. So again, this is uh, this is one third times negative five plus one sixth times twenty five plus one half times negative ten. And if you calculate that out, that's negative two point five. So that tells us that we would expect we would expect to lose two two dollars and fifty cents, sort of on average over those those one thousand games. So is this a game you want to play? Probably not, right? <laughs> So this is kind of very intuitively what I'm what, what we're going to be able to do with talking about the expected value of of a particular experiment. Um, so this this leads us to sort of a a formal definition here. So again, if I have a discrete random variable with a <laughs> set of possible values d, so d could be any any finite or countably infinite set. Um, so I have that's my possible values, and I have my PMF p of x. Um, the expected value. Uh, which we're going to denote with this Greek letter mu. This is a a mu, uh, or or we're going to put a subset uh, a subscript on that at x, just to sort of emphasize we're talking about random variable x um, is just equal to the sum of of all those possible values of x times the probability of that thing happening. So that's kind of kind of what we saw before. I had the probability of so if my if my net winnings could take on three values of uh, negative five, twenty five, and negative ten, I just multiply those times the probability of each of those things happening, and that's kind of the same the same thing that we have here. And again, I, I said that this the the expected value kind of gives you a typical value of what you would expect uh, if you did this experiment over and over. Um, so it kind of gives us a measure of a measure of center. A measure of center, and we'll see that later. It's kind of like a balancing point for what the distribution looks like. We'll see that in just a little bit. So uh, a few more properties here, and then we'll do an example. Uh, if I have, so I can I can, sl I can generalize this slightly. So um, if I same setup, I have a random variable with possible values x and PMF, same PMF. Um, then the expected value of any function h. Uh, is kind of the same thing. So uh, we, on the previous page, we saw that expected value of x was equal to the sum of x and d of x times p of x. So that's kind of a simplification. So this this is the case 
where h of x is just equal to x. So again, any, if I have any function that I'm interested in of that random variable, I can calculate the expected value of that function uh, in this way. And we can actually generalize this even further. So if I have a, a sum of two functions, um, I, can, I can take the sum outside the expected value and just, and just add them up there. Um, so, so my proof here of this corollary is the um, expected value of h1 of x plus h2 of x. Uh, we can kind of think of this as being one, one big function. So this is equal to the sum of x in D of h1 of x plus h2 of x times the PMF, P of x. And then, of course, that sum just distributes through the, through the bigger summation. Uh, we can write this out as sum of x and d of h1 of x times p of x plus another sum of x and d um, of h2 of x, p of x, which is just expected value of h1 of x plus the expected value of h2 of x. All right, well, this is a bad place to stop because I haven't given you a good example to kind of emphasize these things, but we'll pick that back up on Friday. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. Have a good rest of the day. Stay warm out there. Stop this recording real quick.